Welcome to session five of Understanding Anger 2.0. So this is a series that is kind of a reprise of a talk series that I did many years ago called Understanding Anger. And uh, this session is going to be focused on Hesiod and how we see anger and strife depicted and discussed it primarily in his works, um, The Theogony and Works and Days. So uh, this should be an interesting session. I do want to say a little bit about the Understanding Anger series, particularly since this is the first one that we are engaged in live streaming. So Understanding Anger began, as I mentioned, years and years ago. I did nine sessions at the Kingston Public Library looking at depictions, discussions, teachings about anger in a variety of ancient um, literature and primarily philosophy and then going into the Middle Ages. And then we moved here to Milwaukee, so we had to cut the sessions short, unfortunately. And then uh, last academic year, so we're talking, you know, fall of 2022 and spring of 2023, I got to teach a class from Marquette University, several sections of the class, and it was sort of a problems-based class, so I decided to focus on anger, something that I do a lot of research on, and then some people were saying, oh, I wish I could be in that class, and, you know, maybe you should do some sessions on that, so I decided to start doing Understanding Anger 2.0, and this allows me to go back to and actually spend a lot more time on the thinkers, texts, uh, traditions, schools that I think have something to teach us about anger. And we're, we're probably going to continue this on a monthly basis, you know, year after year after year, because there's so many interesting things that we can look at. So at first, we were doing it with Zoom sessions, and uh, then I decided, you know, let's just do these as YouTube lives. And so, you know, you'll have the opportunity in the chat. Mark Smith is already saying uh, uh, hello to everybody. That, that's that's very nice. So we can have some conversations using the chat. I'm going to present about some stuff, but we'll take some time for Q and A here and there in it, and I'll catch up with your your comments doing that as well. And we can have some, some great general discussion, I think. Um, you do want to make sure that your comments are on point. So this is not an AMA. Uh, this is about Hesiod. This is about anger. This is uh, about, you know, those, those sorts of matters. Um, and I'll give priority to, to those. But we can get into some general discussion towards the end of the session if people really want to do that. So let's start out by talking about uh, why Hesiod. So this is uh, our fifth session in Understanding Anger. Our first one was very general. And then we uh, spent two sessions looking at anger in Plato's works and the word that the words that he's using for anger there are primarily orge, when we're going to talk about why that's important, and then thumos, which is this part of our soul that gets angry, very famous in the uh, Republic, right? And then we looked at, um, we sort of went back in time, which is what we're doing today, and we looked at somebody that Plato references quite frequently, or at least characters in Plato do, and that is Homer. And we looked at the role of anger in its various uh, terms, senses in the Iliad. We'll probably get to the Odyssey sometime down the line. Today, we're looking at another really massively important poet for ancient uh, Greek, and then because of that, ancient Mediterranean culture, and that's Hesiod. And Hesiod is, you know, believed to be roughly a contemporary of. Homer, we don't know a ton about the guy, and it's not really that important because this isn't a biographical thing. We're interested in what we find in his works. So what are his works? Well, one of them is actually called Works and Days, and it's a long didactic poem, a couple different things mixed into it, some mythology, uh, a lot of ethical advice, some um, complaining about his brother Perseus, who apparently has uh, taken more than his fair share of the family wealth and is you know, acting kind of like a jerk. 
Um, and then we have the theogony, and theogony means literally the where they came from, the genesis of the divine beings, the, the theoi. And we find that there's a lot of different ones discussed in there. And uh, there's also an interesting thing called the Shield of Hercules, which we'll talk about uh, towards the end. That uh, talk, It's a description of what's on Hercules' shield, and it's also a description of a battle scene that involves not just this legendary Hercules, but even so, some of the gods, uh, and the gods that are most concerned with war, Athena and Ares. And then we have all sorts of like bits and pieces. There's, you know, what we call um, uh, testimonials about, you know, here's what Hesiod said, and these are by other authors. And then we have like bits and pieces of, of things that Hesiod is supposed to have written as well. And I, I thought it would be good to begin with one particular line, um, which is, uh, be careful to avoid the anger of the deathless gods, right? And it's interesting because the translation there that we see pretty consistently is not quite literal. The term that we're translating there as anger is actually opian, which means something more like vengeance, the retribution of the uh, blessed, uh, de you know, deathless gods. And there's this term, um, pephulagmenos, which means you know, you're supposed to guard yourself. You're supposed to be on guard against that. And, and why? Well, because the ancient Greek gods, at least, you know, in the depictions of these um, mythologists, these, these tellers of stories, they do get angry. They experience this human emotion of anger just as much as we do. And it's scarier and more dangerous when the gods get angry because they got so much more power, right? And we're going to talk about some of the interesting ramifications of this in just a bit. So I thought that would be kind of a, a good starting point because you notice that in the works that we're talking about, there is some discussion of human anger, but it's mostly referencing the divine beings of various sorts. And the other thing that I want to say before we actually get into analyzing uh, parts of the text is about vocabulary. And so if you have been in on these sessions or you've watched the, the videos for the sessions before, you know that... Um, the vocabulary, the terminology having to do with anger in ancient Greek is quite rich, and it's going to vary from author to author and from time to time in very important ways. So one of the things that I'd like to point out from the beginning, I mentioned this word orge, right? This is a very, very common term by Plato's time, by Aristotle's time, you know, by later times. And it, it ends up becoming probably the most important and used term for the emotion of anger. But in earlier authors, you don't see it uh, very often at all. So in Hesiod's works, we find very, very few uses of this term, whether as a noun or as a uh, verb that's that's coming from the noun. In works and days, um, we, we find out that both gods and men are angry with a man who lives idle. And so what they're saying there is that there is anger, orgain, for this lazy, you know, SOB who doesn't do anything that they're supposed to do. But there's also another term that gets used in there, nemesosai, uh, um, you know, to take, to be indignant and therefore to pursue revenge or retaliation or punishment of that person. So these things are being connected together. The gods have anger and men also have anger at, at a lazy, you know, lollygagger layabout, as we would say, uh, particularly one who's, you know, succeeding by doing almost nothing. Um, and the word anger is being used there. Later in these fragments, the uh, agemos, uh, which are testimonials, um, we're told that Hesiod says that oaths concerning the matters of love, so eros, do not draw down anger, orge, from the gods. And then in the uh, Melampodia fragments, um, 
you know, some of you may be familiar with the story of poor Teresius, who um, winds up being a woman for a while and, you know, experiences sexual pleasure as both a woman and a man. And he's used to settle a dispute between Hera and Zeus. And anytime that that happens, you're really, you're screwed one way or the other. So he winds up saying that women have 10 times as much pleasure in sex than men. Hera gets angry, she, uh, the, the term there is orgidzesa, right? Uh, or rather, orgidzesa. And so she is angered at him and she punishes him with, with blindness. And then Zeus gives him the capacity to prophesy. So that we don't see too much orge. What do we see? Um, there's another term that I mentioned already that we have to be a little bit careful with. Thumos. So thumos is a word that often does mean anger, but in earlier writings, earlier writers like um, Hesiod and Homer, it also tends to be sort of like Plato. It, it's part of our soul. It's part of our personality. And sometimes it's used for one's heart or soul. There's a lot of other language. Hator is used for heart. Um, friends is, is also used. And so we'll see oftentimes thumos paired with other anger language saying in the person's thumos, in this part of them that can get angry, they felt anger, right? So what are the words that we see being used instead of orge and instead of thumos. So one of the really big ones is one that we discussed already when we were talking about um, uh, Homer, and that is holos or holoin. Um, and uh, this literally means bile that's coming from your liver, but it's used for getting riled up, for getting angry, for being ready to attack somebody else, to fight against them, right? And so this is used a lot in, in Hesiod. Um, kotein and kotos uh, means to bear a grudge, to be angry against somebody. And uh, kotos means something like anger or a grudge that you're holding against somebody. And you hold a grudge because you want to retaliate, which is part of the uh, central dynamic of what anger is, right? Somebody else did you wrong, you want to do something to them. So we've got two words right there. And then we also have another one that's used a lot in Homer, but not quite as much in Hesiod. It's the one that actually begins the Iliad, menace, right? M -E, uh, you know, I'm not saying menace as in like Dennis the Menace, but M-E-N-I-S is how we, how we write it typically when we're transliterating it. And uh, so he doesn't use that too often. He tends to use uh, these, these other terms instead. And then there's another term that I've already mentioned that comes up quite a bit, uh, nemesis, and it's the verb nemestain. We tend to think of a nemesis in contemporary English as like your arch rival or arch enemy, right? But really, a nemesis is a uh, indignation against somebody. You, you think that they did the wrong thing, so you want to punish them. You want to retaliate against them. You, you've got this desire, and it's very close to anger, but it's not exactly the same thing. Uh, and then we have one other term that gets used and it's a verb, agien, um, and it's used mainly to talk about Zeus in this case, who's going to be a major player in this, this uh, set of stories that we're looking at. So we have a, a pretty rich anger vocabulary, and I'll be mentioning it as we go along, um, signaling which ones are being used. Um, now, do we have any sort of analysis? like we did with Plato or like we're going to have in the subsequent sessions with Aristotle of what exactly anger is, how exactly it works. No, we, we, we're not getting quite a in-depth discussion of that. And we're not getting an outlining of like, here's one dynamic of anger, here's another one. Instead, it's just being kind of thrown in and it's viewed as being part of the way in which human beings uh, interact with each other and relate with each other and understand the world. And more importantly, the way that the gods do as well. So as a human being, you always got to be a little bit concerned about not ticking off those 
gods because the gods are not like, you know, later ideas where, you know, God or the divine is perfect, never screws up. These are pretty anthropomorphic gods. So I thought we could start by talking about um, rivalry and strife and anger among humans. You know, and this is a side note. So Hesiod doesn't talk as much about anger as he does about strife, discord, disagreement, uh, people being at odds with each other. And the word for strife is eris, and there's verbal forms for it as well. So one great place to start with here, kind of in the middle of a discussion very early on, is in Works and Days. There's this really famous passage that gets brought up um, by Aristotle and by other people. Potter is angry with potter and craftsman with craftsman and beggar is jealous of beggar and minstrel of minstrel. So we've got you know four paired things where we've got rivalry going on. And notice that there's two different emotional comportments that are possible. So for the potters and for the uh, craft workers, the tectone, people who work with their, their hands, um, they can be rivalrous with each other in the sense of getting angry with each other. And the word there is kote, uh, which is coming from kotos, right? They bear a grudge against each other. They, they don't like when you, you set up shop right next to each other. And then a uh, beggar is um, envious is a better way of translating it. Although, it, I mean, jealousy could be that they want to hold on to what they've got. The word there is thone, and that's a, a, a verb uh, from th thonos, right, which means envy or something like that. And bard or minstrel is, um, you know, viewing the other one as their rival. Now, this is all sort of situated within a longer discussion where, uh, Perse uh, where uh, Perseus is being educated by his brother, who actually, I mean, given the kind of script that Perseus apparently is, according to Hesiod, maybe um, he doesn't have any sort of duty to do that. He's trying to help him out here. And he tells him that there's two different kinds of strife and strife is eris, right? And one of them is praised when understood, the other of which is blameworthy. And here he says something really, really interesting. The translations oftentimes will kind of mix this up. So the next line is they are divided or they're different by nature. But it's really they have a divided or twofold thumos. So the thumos of the person who is feeling or acting out these kinds of strife is different in a polar personality. So what are these two different kinds of strife? He says, one of these fosters evil war and battle. We get, we get upset with each other. We get in conflict. We're rivals. Maybe we get angry. We hold grudges. We want to damage and destroy and you know, push somebody else out. But he says the other one stirs up even the shiftless to toil, making a person eager to work when they consider their neighbor. So you look at other people <clears throat> and you're like, oh, man. They've got stuff that I wish I had. Um, I guess I'm going to have to work for it, right? And this is a, a big theme in Perseus. Keep your hands off other people's stuff. Make, make stuff for yourself. <clears throat> Don't um, You can look to them and say, oh, maybe they've got something that I could learn from them or I, I want to aspire to be where they are but you're not supposed to like go over there and steal their tools or despoil them of their things. Instead, you, you focus on your own work. And Perseus is told to lay these things up in his heart and heart. There is a translation of Thumos. And uh, Hesiod tells him, don't let the strife that delights in badness hold your heart back from work. So the Greek there is eris, Kakor, uh, kakohartos, 
op ergu thumon efukoi. So thumos again is, is coming up there. And the bad, um, the bad heiress, the bad strife is one that uh, delights in, in badness, that sets its hands to badness. And it's, it's, it's a, you know, not supposed to keep you from ergon doing work, doing the things that you need to do. And this is also where the discussion comes in of gods and human beings feeling anger towards other people who are living an idle life, who are, you know, not doing what they ought to do to maintain themselves, to take care of things. And then he says one other thing in this. So before, you know, the right kind of strife <coughs> is orienting us to look at our neighbor and say, oh, I could you know, maybe increase my flocks like they are, or, oh, they're planting, maybe I should go plant, or they just built a nice building, maybe I should, you know, fix up my house. He says at a certain point in this that what we need to do is turn our mind away from focusing on our neighbors and instead focus on our own work. So you're not just supposed to be constantly looking at your neighbors, because if you do, you might get, you know, upset with them. Focus on your task and you'll see an increase in the resources that you have. You know, you'll um, not be so prone to, as he criticizes his brother for, going to the law courts and stirring up trouble, right? He actually says you need to have a year's worth of goods uh, set aside before you can even think about going to court. And, and if you go to court, you know, it's kind of a crapshoot anyway. So this is a good place to take uh, some questions. We've <coughs> looked at one main theme concerning anger here, the rivalry that we see, the strife between human beings. It can be turned into good strife, but it's very easy for us to turn it into bad strife. And if we don't want to work, people are going to get ticked off at us. Um, so I, I'm going to uh, skip over Seb's question until like much later because that's that's very general. But does anybody have any questions about the anger vocabulary or this first theme of um, you need to to you know pay attention to the right kind of strife and engage in the good kind of work? Otherwise, you're liable to have your rivals getting ticked off at you or you get ticked off at them. Um, we want to try to avoid that. Anger is very clearly seen here as, on the one hand, something that it would be good for you to try to avoid feeling, and you also want to avoid becoming the target of other people's anger by being, uh, you know, he, he actually talks about drones, uh, you know, in, in beehives, that they're, they're good for nothing. Yeah? People will get ticked off at that. So any questions about those themes? Maybe not. Um, well, let's let's move on. And if you do have uh, questions that come up about that, we'll jump into them as we go along. So another big key theme, uh, I think you could probably predict. Um, oh, Daniel has a question. Should we take care of jealousy of the gods or the anger, or the thumos of the gods? So thumos, again, not anger, right? It's where the gods do have a thumos in the sense of like having a place where the anger is felt, but that's not usually the word for it. Um, we should take care of both of these, but it's not jealousy of the gods, it's envy of the, of the gods. Typically, we think of jealousy as like somebody feels threatened by somebody else perhaps taking away what they've got. So I, I would be jealous if my wife were talking to somebody else and appears to be, you know, very engaged in flirty conversation. I'm envious if I look at what somebody else has and I say, I want to have that. So the gods, the gods don't really need to be jealous so much of us human beings, but they can be envious of us, you know, like if we're too happy. Uh, and yeah, Hesiod and Homer both think that we need to watch out for that. And so that's one reason for living a kind of moderate ethical life. So this is a, a great lead into God punishing human beings for transgressions. And Zeus plays a major role in Hesiod's works. So he says that um, Zeus gets angry 
And the word there is agietai. And he punishes um, those who do wrong in various ways. <clears throat> and he gives some examples of this. So um, being abusive to your father in their old age, when they become vulnerable, they're no longer powerful. Now you're the powerful one treating your, your father like crap or sleeping with your brother's wife, right? Going and committing adultery, which violates the relations uh, with your, your family member and casts, you know, any, if there's somebody that results from it through pregnancy, nobody's sure who the dad is, right? Uh, and it's also wrong in relation to the, the wife as well. Or doing wrong to a suppliant. So a suppliant is somebody who comes to you and says, oh, help me out, help me out. And so if you're like, screw you, man, I'm going to throw you in a well, that's doing wrong to them. Or even worse, to a guest. So you notice the examples that Hesiod is using there are of determinate relationships. He's not like, yeah, Zeus will get mad with you for going up to any old random person on the street and being mean to them. It's more like the violation of relationships where there's some sort of expectation. And in works and days later on, he'll say, you need to be careful to avoid the anger, not just of Zeus, but of the deathless gods. And then we get a whole like ethical doctrine being laid out there. All these counsels about moral life, um, some of which have to do with friendship, like who should you be friends with and um, what should you do when you get in conflict with your friends and the friendship seems to be broken. Um, he talks about being wronged and retaliating, but also being ready if the other person is willing to admit the wrong that they did um, to forgive them and restore the relationship. Um, he also has a really interesting one about not taunting a person who is poor. And he uses like the, you know, in the bitterness of their poverty, right? So not, if you're in a higher position, not as we say, kicking down or punching down to people who are in worse off positions. He also gives all sorts of advice about ceremonial matters, some of which is kind of funny, but we probably don't care about that much. Like, you know, you shouldn't urinate in the middle of a road or something like that, you know. And then he has one thing that he says that's really quite interesting about these ceremonial manners. He says, do not make a mock of mysteries, meaning, you know, things that are revealed within the religious life. And then he says, because God or the divine, Theos, he doesn't say which God, he just says Theos will take revenge, nemesa. Uh, so there's that word nemesis again, right? Uh, is the, are the gods angry in that case? Eh, maybe not, but certainly they're riled up and they think what you're doing is the wrong thing and they don't like it and they're going to, you know, they're going to do you in for, for that. So, you know, there's this sense of, as we see in other religions, uh, the divine take an interest in our lives. Um, they may not be perfect themselves, but they certainly don't like seeing us being jerks to other people, uh, particularly if we're doing so in relation to those that we have some sort of commitment to or who are particularly vulnerable to us. There's a sense that the gods, or at least Zeus, looks after the person who's in a bad condition. And then there's this really interesting story in, that gets told about the races of human beings. And many of you might be familiar with this. And uh, anger plays a role in this. So there's five races of human beings. And it starts out with a golden age and a golden race of people. They have a great, easy, happy life. They don't screw up at all. You know, they live a long time. And when they do die, they become the good daimones, the good spirits that can be, you know, invoked or stuff like that. So they become part of the religious life of the ancient Greeks. And then we have a silver race that follows them. And these are not so good. They're actually kind of stupid or foolish is, is the way that they're described. And he also says they can't keep from sinning or doing wrong. They can't keep themselves from falling in 
into hamartia, error or mistake or, you know, doing the wrong thing. And um, because of this, they couldn't stop themselves from wronging each other, which we see in the gods don't like that. But they also wouldn't serve the gods. And if there's one thing that's going to tick the gods off, it's not observing the proper relation to the divine, right? So they're unwilling to serve the gods. And Zeus is like, all right, we're going to, you know, imagine I'm crumpling up a paper and throwing it away. We're going to take care of this crap. Uh, these people, you know, we're going to... Um, erase them and start anew. So, so he says that Zeus gets angry, holumenos, right? There's that holos again, and he put them away. And so they become the blessed spirits of the underworld. They're not bad, um, but they're kind of scary and they're kind of, you know, capricious, but you do have to appropriate them. Then we get the people of bronze, they're said to be terrible and strong. They're lovers of Ares, the god of war, and of doing violence. And Zeus doesn't even have to take care of them because they destroy themselves. They're destroyed by their own hands. And then in between our generation and this bronze generation, there's another that's not identified with any metal whatsoever. These, this is a nobler and more just race, and these are hero men. He uses the word hero there, uh, who we call demigods, half gods, right? And some of these are destroyed by war, for example, in the battles around Thebes that you know play a, a role in the whole Oedipus Chronicle. Um, some of them are killed at Troy. So these are you know, these include the heroes of Troy as well. And others, Zeus will take to the end of the earth and they get to live in the Isles of the Blessed. And by the way, heroes played an, an important role in the religion in, in um, ancient Greece as well. You would find shrines to them. Certain of the heroes or demigods would actually become full-fledged gods like Hercules, um, kind of an outlier in that respect, right? Um, others have a bad end. Some are, are less heroic than others. And then we get to our race, the iron race, the current race. There's lots of trouble and suffering and conflict. There's a lot of violation of norms in relations. There's many people who enjoy and desire evil. And in two different places in that discussion, he'll talk in terms of might or strength being right or goodness. Now, it's not really that way, but this is the way people portray it. And so Hesiod is kind of a pessimist about human affairs. As a matter of fact, if you wanted to liken this to any other um, non-Greek text, you could think of the book of Ecclesiastes, right? Uh, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. People do all these sort of bad things, but we're still supposed to do the right thing, uh, even if we won't necessarily get rewarded for it because it's the right thing. Um, maybe the gods will be merciful to us and all of that. Um, there's one other thing I want to bring up, and then maybe we'll do some more Q&A. Twice, the story of Prometheus and Zeus and human beings gets told, and anger figures into that as well. So in Works and Days, we get a shorter version of the story, and we find that Zeus, in the anger of his heart, uh, so holos amenos fre fresin, friends is, is your, your like chest and your heart, holos amenos means pissed off, angered, right? Full of holos, rage, anger, uh, um, a desire to, to punish. And so in the anger of his heart, he hid from human beings the possibility of just a little bit of work making plenty of resources. That's why we have to work like dogs, because Zeus, who could have showed us how to live an easy life, won't do it for us. And why is he ticked off? Because Prometheus tricked him. So he 
planned sorrow and mischief against humans. And we see some, some misogyny in here. Uh, there's some interesting remarks about women scattered throughout, but Zeus makes women to um, be a sort of problem for, for human beings. And um, Pandora is, is, is one of the first of these, right? And you all know the story of Pandora's box and opening it up and all the bad things for human beings. Now, why is, why is Zeus, the most powerful of the gods, screwing around with human beings in this kind of petty and vindictive way? So we find out in the Theogony, we get the fuller story. He's told that uh, Zeus imposes a penalty on Prometheus. Prometheus is one of the generation prior to Zeus that we call the Titans, right? The uh, sons and daughters of uh, heaven and earth. So this is very early on in, in the story. And the penalty is that he's cast into bonds that he can't break. He's got a shaft impaling him on this rock through the middle of his body. And then this giant eagle comes by every day to eat his liver. And now notice, eating his liver is kind of funny. It's taking away the possibility of his holos, of being angry, right? So it's a subjection. And unfortunately, because Prometheus is uh, immortal, his liver grows back every day. And so each day it's a fresh new hell. Now we find that Hercules, now Hercules is a son of Zeus, right? Hercules kills that bird and frees Prometheus. Hesiod tells us this is not without the will of Zeus, uh, Eketi, uh, in this, this case. So not without Zeus being okay with it. And so you might say, well, why did Zeus uh, um, get okay with it? And, you know, Hesiod's answer is, you know, so Hercules could have his glory, um, but what we read here is that Zeus is angry, but also ceases from his anger. So, he is he was angry, right? Uh, but then, paute holu paute he uh, ended. He ceased his holos. So he is full of holos, and then he's he's not anymore. And where did this anger come from? Well, Prometheus screwed with him twice. <laughs> So the first time is Prometheus divides up portions of an ox for him and Zeus to share. And he gives Zeus uh, some stuff on the top part that looks really great. And then it's all crappy stuff, you know, like the bones and things like that. And he keeps uh, the better share over here. And then he's like, hey, Zeus, you get to decide which of these you want. And Zeus figures out what, what uh, Prometheus is, is up to. So he doesn't like that. Um, he gets angry about the trick, right? And we see Josato, a de frenas. So he's, he's angry about the trick. And he's angry not just at Prometheus, but for a weird reason, human beings too, maybe because they're the ones sacrificing. And then we read Holos de min iketo thumon. So he has Holos anger in his, his thumos. And so that's the that's the start. That's the beginning of the beef, we could say, right? So he won't give human beings fire. And this goes back to the like, you know, Zeus could have made it easy for human beings, but he doesn't do it. Fire really does change the game for human beings, right? So he won't give human beings fire. Uh, Prometheus sneaks in. I think many of you are familiar with the story. He hides a little cinder in his reed. Uh, pipe. And then we find out that Zeus learning of this is stung in spirit, right? Uh, and again, we see thumon being the word that's translated as spirit there. And his dear heart is angered. Philon hetor is his dear heart. And echolose, he has again, holos, bile in his heart. And he does this because um, Prometheus engaged in hubris, in doing wrong, in insulting him. So he feels like Prometheus has wronged him directly by helping out these human beings. And so, you know, he's going he's gonna to impose a penalty on Prometheus, which only the intervention of this demigod, who then eventually becomes a god, Hercules, 
his son is able to resolve. So good place to take some more question and answer. If you've got any uh, remarks about uh, these points, um, and then we're going to go on to the theogony itself and look at some of the crazy stuff that's depicted there. And we'll, we'll also finish up by looking at the shield of Hercules. But any, any questions about the punishment of human beings, the Prometheus thing, uh, this whole thing about the races of human beings and what a you know crappy age we're in, even though it's an age where we have fire, you know, uh, which is pretty good. All right. In the meantime, while people are perhaps writing things, I'll, I'll say just a, a few things um, about Hesiod. Um, obviously, he's not cited quite as often as Homer in the philosophical literature about anger, but he is important, you know. Um, Sometimes there's a bit of a digression. Just, uh, I'll say this in case anybody's going to write a question. Um, people will talk about Homer and Hesiod being the Bible for the Greeks, and that's not quite correct. I mean, Bible means a whole bunch of books, ta biblia, right? And um, it's not as if that was the only stuff that they looked to. Obviously, other forms of poetry like the tragic and comedic poets and lyric poets were important for them as well. But you could say that they certainly enjoyed a high status. And the one way in which they were kind of like um, the Bible is that people do what, what's called proof texting, where they write um, or they, they write or they bring up or they, they throw out like little passages taken out of context. And, you know, sometimes you're supposed to know the context. Well, people would do that with Homer and Hesiod quite a bit, you know, and so all of these ethical injunctions, they might get brought up by somebody else. So Mark says, seems like people have been getting grumpy about generational differences for a long time. The present always sucks compared to the good old days. Yeah, although Hesiod is actually saying this was the good old days were way before any of us were born. Right. But I think you are quite correct. And, and we can steer this into thinking about anger. Um, when you go back in time, you find people uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years saying, you know, this new generation of kids, they're, they're, they don't have any respect. They're no good. They don't follow traditional values, you know. And once you see enough of this stuff, you know, like recurring as complaints through the history of ideas, you, you kind of get the sense that maybe some of these complaints are not as justified as people make them out to be and that maybe it has to do with like getting old and not being happy about the fact that other people now are, you know, the initiative lies with them. This, this notion of like youth culture began in the 50s, not really true, you know. Um, as most generalization, generalizations aren't in, in when it comes to the history of ideas and human beings. All right, well, let's, let's talk about the theogony. So the theogony is a big, big story, a poem about where did all these divine creatures come from, or not even creatures, these divine beings that came into being um, because they weren't like created as such. They were more generated, right? So the, the goni part is, is important. And, um, you know, it begins with, with uh, chaos and heaven and earth and all that. And then uh, one of the important points, given our theme of, of strife and anger, is that strife, Eris, is herself a um, goddess, right? So heaven and earth have their children and um, heaven hates his first children. He hides them in secret places of the earth and he delights in his evil doing. And then earth suggests they take revenge. And, you know, who's actually going to step up? It's Kronos. Kronos, who's going to become the king of the gods after that? Well, heaven is about to have sex with, uh, his, you know, Kronos is his dad. He's going to have sex with his mother. Um, Kronos comes up and castrates his dad. He's got a sickle and cuts his his nuts off. And, uh, he had, you know, there's blood that drops on, on the earth. And those were the Irenes, the peaceful ones. 
come from, the, the spirits of revenge. He throws uh, uh, the testicles into the, um, the ocean and Aphrodite comes out of the foam, right? There's all sorts of cool stories there. And then there's others as well. The fates are born from Nook's night. And, uh, you know, Hesiod has an interesting thing to say about them. They give humans their good and evil, and they pursue transgressions of human beings, but also the gods. Even the gods are subject to the fates. And he says they don't cease from their dread or scary anger. Denoyo holoios. Oh, wait, once again, holos, right? Uh, denos means scary, frightening, terrifying. And they don't cease from that until they punish. Night also generates nemesis. This, this spirit of uh, what we've talked about is like, you know, punishing, getting revenge, indignation, but also a whole bunch of other things, deceit and friendship, hateful age, and then hard-hearted strife. Strife is eris, hard-hearted, cartero thumo, having a enduring thumos, having a hard, a can push through it all, a ruthless thumos, you could say. And then Strife has a bunch of children in her own turn. She's quite productive. It doesn't say who she uh, sleeps with, but we do have some cases where, you know, there's what we what gets called parthenogenesis, right? Um, having children without, uh, or bringing forth children without having sex. So Strife begins toil, forgetfulness, famine, sorrows, fighting, Battles, murders, manslaughters, quarrels, lying words, disputes, lawlessness, and ruin. And they're said to be all of one nature, or better yet, character. Uh, soon atheas alelesin. So alelesin means in relation to each other. So you could say um, like to each other. And then soon together. And atheas, so ethos is character, right? So um, this is quite interesting. And then she throws, or he throws in one other one, Oath, Horcus, who goes after those who take a false oath. So strife is very, very productive, right? And creates all sorts of things that could be manifestations of anger or arouse anger or provoke anger. Um, and then we come back to Kronos uh, after all of this, and this begat that. And there's many more stories in there. Kronos uh, is trying to avoid being overcome by his own child, as earth and heaven tell him is going to be the case, because it's sort of revenge for what he did to his own father. So what does he do? He has sex with Rhea, and he swallows all of his children, or at least he thinks that he does. And um, Rhea is, you know, grieved at this. She wanted ever her, her babies and have them grow up. And so she consults with her mother and father, Earth and Heaven, about how payback can be imposed for their children and for Kronos's father. And um, the, the terms there, tisaito, uh, erinus, patros, eo, pa, paidon. So, how can payback be um, imposed on her, her husband? And so, you know, Zeus is brought up in secret. Kronos swallows a stone. Uh, Zeus grows up. They get him to throw up. And now there's war between Kronos and all of his buddies in his generation and Zeus and this new generation of, of gods. And they fight for 10 years. Um, and it's very bitter fighting, said to be with bitter wrath, right? Uh, holos is again used there, uh, holos towards each other, alelusi. And um, then Zeus decides to bring the other titans who are not on uh, the side of Kronos and his titans out of these secret places of the earth. These are the really powerful uh, titans that that Uranos originally stuck down there in places like like Tartarus, you know, like the hundred handed ones who can pick up a hundred rocks and throw them all at the same time, you know, and these allies um, being delivered from their murky gloom and merciless bonds. Um, 
begin fighting on the side of the gods against the Titans. And Zeus himself like takes, you know, he, he, he goes into, let's call it wrath mode. Um, he has his heart filled with wrath. And once again, holos is the word that's being used there. And he um, goes and he like starts throwing lightning bolts around and, and they win. And the, the, the Titans lose. Uh, and then there's one other interesting fighting story in there that, that comes up as well. Um, Typhon is, is another create or another generated uh, God. We get the word Typhoon from this. And Typhon is one of the most powerful, but Zeus defeats him, throws him again into Tartarus. Uh, in the bitterness of his anger, Thumos is used there in, a, in one of the few places where it's it's being used to designate anger and not just where anger is. And the other thing that comes up in the theogony that's quite interesting, we find out that Hera is furious with and quarreled with Zeus. So these are, you know, the two key themes that we're talking about here. Quarreled with is... Erisa has strife with, quite literally, and then is furious with. Amenese uh, is is another term that's that's being used for anger here, and it's not used a lot in Hesiod, and it means something like to be furious with, to have a lot of anger in relation to somebody. So Hera, why is she furious with Zeus? Because he'll screw everything that moves, you know, and he doesn't listen to her very much. And so this is where it gets really quite interesting. She has Hephaestus on her own without having sex with Zeus. She brings him forth um, just out of herself. And so we've got a lot of anger going on in the theogony, all these strifes between gods, some of which you could say are like proto-political, who's going to be in charge, who's going to rule, some of which are domestic that have to do with you know, the relationship between husband and wife, as we see with uh, Hera. And then we've got this very interesting kind of, you know, the, the universe is filled with strife and strife produces all these things that are productive of anger, reflective of anger, um, you know, prolonging of anger, fighting battles, murders, lawlessness, ruin, all of these sorts of things. And this is the way that, that, um, Again, Hesiod is depicting the universe that human beings live within as kind of a tough one. There's gods, but there's all sorts of other beings as well that, you know, um, are not, you know, they're part of the moral landscape, but it's not a beautiful moral landscape, we could say. And you, got, you really got to watch out for them. Even with the gods, they can get ticked off at you and then, you know, you can get in trouble. So you should be a good person, but goodness isn't necessarily rewarded. And um, badness isn't always punished in the way that it it should be. So it's, it's a very interesting moral universe that's being depicted here in terms of strife and in terms of anger. So before we look at the shield of Hercules and start wrapping up or opening things up to more general questions, any questions about the theogony or any of the other stuff that we've um, looked at so far in Hesiod's works uh, respecting anger. While we're uh, waiting for anybody to ask any questions, I'll, I'll mention, you know, so there's these two main works and then there's this thing that we call the Shield of Hercules, which is a very interesting composition. As I mentioned, it's about like, I would say more than half of it is about just depicting what did the shield of Hercules look like? And there's so much stuff being depicted on there that either it would have to be very, very tiny or his shield must have just been incredibly massive. And it is, you know, it's often looked at by, um, classicists as a very interesting example of an artistic depiction of an artistic object that doesn't really exist except in the narrative world in which it's created. But it's described in such 
uh, vividness and detail that we can imagine it. And people must have just been spellbound hearing about this and, and thinking about it, you know. Um, so that that's that's quite an interesting feature. So I don't see any any questions. Maybe there'll be some uh, later on. Let's talk about the shield of Hercules then. So there's there's the two things. There's the depiction of the shield at great length, and then there's this other depiction of a battle between Hercules and this other guy. Um, it's translated in different ways. The 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 Greek for it would be Kunkus, uh, and he's a son of Ares, right? So he's a demigod himself. He's 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 a spearman. So is uh, Hercules. They fight with spears and shield. And let's talk about the shield first. So there is this long, long depiction of the shield. I'm not going to go through everything, but I will say this. Um, there's there's uh, three really interesting features of it. So one is that the shield itself contains images of pursuit and flight, tumult, panic, slaughter, strife, uproar, and fate. Fate understood as a single individual, not as the three individuals. So, you know, we don't get like great descriptions, sub descriptions of these. We're just told that these are on the shield and you can see them on that shield. And then we get all sorts of other descriptions. And many of them include animals, but many of them also include men who are fighting like around a city and stuff like that. And I think the most interesting one has to do with um, lions and boars glaring at each other. On it now, the boar and the lion are both aggressive animals, right? And as a matter of fact, we see in Hercules's own story, he has to overcome a lion, he has to overcome a, a boar. Uh, these are pretty scary creatures, particularly in ancient times. And there were, in fact, lions still in Europe at the time. Um, there are still wild boars in Europe. I remember when I was in the army in Germany, we could hear them snuffling around in the forest when we were marching at night. And I was thinking to myself, holy crap, if one of these goes after us, we've got these unloaded, you know, M16s. They're not going to do anything against these. You can like poke them with it, but they're not going to care. These are, these are scary, fierce creatures. Right. And so, um, the lions and the boars are depicted as like ready to fight with each other and as being on two sides. And they are furious with each other. Uh, they are filled with kotos, with, with rage against each other. And they are being roused to fight by their very anger. Um, so we've got a depiction of anger both embodied in these kinds of creatures and in their relation to each other on this shield, which is a, you know, part of the arms of war. Ares himself is also on the shield. So interestingly, Ares, who's playing a role in the story, is on Hercules's shield, and we're getting it, this narrated by Hesiod. So what happens? Um, Athena shows up and gives uh, Hercules some advice. He says, listen, after you kill uh, Cucnus, uh, um, Ares, his father, is going to show up and try to fight you. Here's where you can wound Ares himself, the god of war. Here's where you can wound a, an immortal. So uh, Hercules and uh, Cucnus fight each other, and it's said that they fight each other like lions springing on each other in fury. And the same word is used once again, coteontes, right? So they are like the lions on the shield, but now they are lions springing in fury against each other. And there's a you know interesting battle scene that takes place. Obviously, who wins? Hercules. And then Ares comes on, and how does he come on? Like a lion whose dark heart, Melifrono, is filled with rage. And here again, we see for you know, one of the few times, Thumos 
being used to do, as a synonym for anger, no longer as the part, because the fr the the you know uh, friends is where um, the uh, anger is 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 being felt. So uh, Athena herself, you know, they fight back and forth and all that. And Athena herself intervenes and tells Ares to hold back his anger. Here we see another anger word being used, a fairly rare one, uh, menace, the one that's used of Achilles' rage, right? Uh, she tells Ares to hold back his, his anger because it's not ordained that he should kill Hercules, but Ares doesn't care. He's, he's angry. He's, he's, you know, going after him. So he goes after Hercules and then Hercules wounds him. <laughs> Hercules is able to wound a god and not just any god, but the god of war itself. And then Ares exits the scene and, you know, Hercules is triumphant through the, the help of Athena, who is, by the way, the big arch rival of Ares, you know, they will actually clash in the Iliad towards the end of the uh, the work um, when the gods themselves are fighting each other. So we have, again, very suggestive, interesting idea about these warriors, uh, human and, and God, well, or demigod and God fighting each other. Um, a lot of likening to lions who are uh, an emblematic animal when it comes to rage, at least for the ancient Greeks, and I'd say for many other cultures as well. So that's that's all that I've got for you. Um, we've got, you know, some time if people have questions, comments, want to uh, engage in, in further discussion. I will take uh, Seb's uh, more general question now and, uh, while other people are writing um, things down. Can you give some <clears throat> tips about formative philosophical works, primarily in the ancient tradition that expound on a wealth of practical philosophical concepts, stuff to really dig into. So, yeah, every one of the main schools of philosophy that we have from ancient uh, uh, Mediterranean culture has a, a lot of practical philosophical concepts. It really depends on how you're reading it. So let's take Plato as a, a good starting point, right? There's way more going on in Platonic dialogues than summaries of Platonic dialogues or approaches that say, what is the main argument here? Or what is the topic here? And does Socrates adequately resolve it? Then those can bring to, to light. I'll give you a prime example. In the Mino, uh, it's viewed as an operatic dialogue because they don't re they don't make it to a finish point. You know, there's an operia being stuck in place. They never do manage to define what virtue is, but they do teach you a lot of things about virtues along the way, including the primacy of two of the virtues in particular, justice and practical wisdom. Right. So if you're paying close attention to the text and you're not just like looking at what's the main point, you find all this uh, incredible stuff along the way. Um, you know, Plato doesn't have any place where he says, OK, now we're going to talk about anger at great length. But you can take the things that he has to say and piece them together and get a very interesting, coherent idea of what anger is and how it matters and how we can deal with it. Same thing for Aristotle and the whole Aristotelian tradition, right? And I should mention that Plato, if we talk about Platonism, Plato is just the starting point. We have all sorts of important neo or yeah, Neoplatonists at the, the hind end and then middle Platonists like um, Plutarch, who has a, a wealth of, of writings, and Alcinous and, and a few others. Um, Aristotle, the Aristotelian tradition continues on all the way to people like Alexander of Aphrodisias. We have the whole Stoic tradition, um, which, you know, we isn't just confined to authors like Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius and Seneca and uh, Musonius Rufus and Heracles. We have summaries of Stoic doctrine in Diogenes Laertes and Arius Didymus. Um, neither of whom are Stoics, and in Cicero, who's not a Stoic himself, but who thinks that that's important. So now we've got three 
main philosophical traditions. We've also got the Epicurean tradition. We've lost a lot of Epicurus's writings, but we know a lot about what the Epicureans thought and taught. And we do have some later writers. And there's a skeptic tradition. There's the cynic tradition. You know, there's all these really rich things. And then we could say, well, what, what beyond philosophy? We have literature. And that's part of what we're studying in like this session, you know, and in later sessions where we're going to look at tragic uh, poetry like that of Aeschylus and uh, Sophocles and Euripides. And there's teaching about things going on in those, but not in a directly philosophical manner, but in a quasi philosophical manner. And then, you know, as we move into late antiquity and we see the importance of certain religious perspectives, particularly Judaism and Christianity, but also a kind of uh, neo-paganism uh, arising. We have all these great authors who are taking in the insights from these earlier schools and placing them in a new framework and thinking through those things. So uh, lots and lots of, of people, movement, texts that, you know, are these formative philosophical works that expound on a wealth of practical philosophical um, concepts. I mean, the, the, the thing that I won't say sucks about that, because um, it all depends on how you look at it, is there's almost too much for you to really read and assimilate and make your own um, within the, you know, the scope of a lifetime, right? once you start digging into it. All right, um, Daniel, is the destiny of the three sisters somehow a kind of uber God, a principle of universal justice, an anticipation of the form of justice and the good? I would say no, no, um, primarily. Uh, and it's not the destiny, it's the fates, plural, right? Um, and destiny and fate, not, not exactly the same thing. You want to you wanna stick with, with that. Um, uh, the fates are the, the ones who punish gods and, and men, but it doesn't say that they punish fairly, right? And you don't need them necessarily in the picture to already have justice and goodness. And, you know, it, it, I, I would also not worry so much about um, the form of justice and the form of the good as we find them in Plato because uh, Hesiod doesn't have anything remotely like that. And the form of justice is not, so justice is one of the, the four cardinal virtues, maybe five if we take the Protagoras into account, right? And the form of the good is also the form of the beautiful that we find in the symposium. But, and we're just talking about this actually uh, at, at a recent conference, the form of justice is not the same thing as the form of the good in Plato as far as we can tell, right? Uh, it, it's, it's one of the other forms that are contributed to by the form of the good or the, the beautiful. But I wouldn't, read the, I wouldn't read the fates into that. They're, they're darker. They're, they're not as, I mean, with, with Plato, if you experience the form of beauty or the form of the good, you're like, oh, this is so wonderful. There's nothing bad about the experience, right? Whereas running into the fates, not usually so good. <laughs> Right. Uh, power. Does God exist? Irrelevant to this this discussion. Mark, anger is such a rich theme for storytelling. Fascinating to see it portrayed in such a diverse set of conflicts from political and domestic to cosmic. Yeah, good. Cosmological in Hesiod's works. That that's very true. Um, that's that's a term I should have used before. Um, cosmological. So I mentioned that we have like domestic and we have like quasi-political, you could call it social, right? But this is indeed cosmological. Hesiod doesn't say that the universe is fair, but he does think that there are, you know, sort of like norms that are woven into it in some, you know, weird, probably contradictory way that we can access and uh, live up to at least to some degree. And we'd better do that because there's other beings out there more powerful than us that also care about these things. And so if we don't care enough about them, they will see what we do and punish us. <laughs> right? So... 
<laughs> kind of a kind of an interesting uh, thing, you know. And you get the idea that the world that Hesiod lives in is not a very pleasant world, is it? Um, but you know, I think he thinks of himself. Now we wouldn't say he's being realistic, right? Because we don't believe in like all the Greek gods or stuff like that. But um, for his time, perhaps we could say that he is being very realistic, right? Any other questions, comments, um, concerns, things that people want to bring up? Um, Still getting woken up by my coffee. While people are writing, I'll just mention a little bit of trivia. I was out pretty late last night with my oldest kid um, here at the world's largest uh, music festival, Summerfest. That's been going on for more than 50 years in the Milwaukee area, right, right downtown, right on the lake. And we got to see a bunch of metal bands. And actually, I mean, this could actually tie in. So... Um, we saw Vixen, who were amazing. Uh, we saw Queensryche, that was the ender of the night. And then in between, we saw Steven Adler, who was Guns N' Roses' original drummer, and he did a lot of the uh, songwriting. And it was basically a Guns N' Roses tribute band with one original member. And then we saw Autograph before that. And Autograph, people know from Turn Up the Radio. Um, and you know, they didn't really have any other big hits, but they're kind of a fun party band. Vixen was, was really quite something. And what was really cool with Queensryche, who are a, you know, early prog metal band, he, you know, everything got turned up cause they're the headliners. And so the bass was really strong and the bassist is like the original guy and he's really, really good. And bass is incredibly important for, uh, heavy metal. Um, you know, you've got the guitars kind of screaming and, and doing things like, like uh, you know, big riffs and all that and, you know, great drumming. And the, the singer is one of the most he, he's a replacement for Jeff Tate, who is one of the most operatic singers in heavy metal. So hearing some of these songs that I've been hearing for decades and decades, you know, like in my headphones or on car speakers or stuff like that hearing them actually played live it is quite a spectacle and you know there's a lot of like discussion how angry is heavy metal music there's certainly uh, a connection between aggressivity and that but it, interestingly research has borne out that for fans of heavy metal uh, listening to heavy metal which will sometimes rile other people up is actually a calming thing. You sort of slip into the music. Now, that's that's a bit of a digression. Uh, Mark has some questions here. Any interesting comparisons you would draw between Hesiod's and Homer's depictions of the gods' anger? Are they fairly consistent in their portrayals, or are there notable differences? <laughs> so, um, and demigods' anger. I would say that they're consistent in that the gods are not particularly good at controlling their anger. Right? They, they get angry at each other, at human beings, pretty easily. There is um, sometimes, you know, like talking with each other and saying, you need to control your anger, but it's much more frequent that like they just get angry with each other and then do things. So I would say, you know, that, that actually... Um, fits in quite well. So it says catharsis, metal, have healthy use of aggression and anger, individuate the shadow. I'm not a fan of, of Jungian concepts, so I don't, I don't, you know, think of things in terms of the shadow. Um, but, you know, there is, there is something, you know, it's very interesting. Plato, Aristotle, both talk about the capacity for different modes of music to, arouse our emotions in different ways. And, you know, catharsis is one of those terms that um, gets used so much that it's almost become kind of a cliche. Um, originally, it means like purification or cleansing. And interestingly, where it comes up, you know, like, for example, in Aristotle's poetics, it's not about 
catharsis of anger, but rather of pity and fear. Um, but there's no reason why anger couldn't be included in it. Um, and it, there's nothing to say that it couldn't have different effects on different people depending on their psychologies, right? So this is why you could have people, you know, parents in particular being worried about, why are you listening to that angry music? It sounds so angry. And you'd be like, well, it's not making me angry. <laughs> it might be making you angry, right? Uh, Daniel says, Homer is heavy metal for me when Achilles is fighting uh, Hanatos. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not as if metal is unique in depicting or invoking aggressivity and anger. Um, and not all metals like that. I mean, if any of you have seen the show Metapocalypse, and you think about um, the different characters involved. So this is an adult swim show that had like the ideal black metal band called Death Clock. And, you know, they've got the super talented guitarist, Swiss Gar. They've got, you know, uh, a drummer who's from Wisconsin, Pickles. They've got Nathan Explosion, who's sort of like a bigger, dumber Glenn Danzig. Um uh, who's the singer and the band leader. And then they've got William Murderface, Murderface as the bassist. And then there's this guy, Toki. And Toki is also Scandinavian. I believe that he's Norwegian and Swisscar is Swedish. And Swisscar won't let him play any solos or stuff like that. He's stuck in in rhythm guitar because he's, he's definitely not as good as, as uh, uh, Swisscar, who's constantly playing. And, you know, when they play and they do have like music in the cartoons, um, it's like legitimate death metal. You can actually buy their albums and it's very aggressive, very harsh. Right. It's all, all these morbid themes when they're allowed when Toki's allowed to be on his own. He makes songs about rainbows and fuzzy bunnies and stuff like that. That's, he doesn't quite fit the the ethos. And I would say that there's there, you know, there's some heavy metal that's more like Toki's style, you know, and then there's the, the hedonistic stuff too, right? You've got um, uh, Pickles used to be in the band Snakes and Ladders, which is obviously supposed to be Guns and Roses. <laughs> and, you know, that's all about like uh, debauchery and doing cocaine. There's even a uh, guy, there's a character who's modeled after David Lee Roth called Roxo the Rock and Roll Clown. Who his, his key line is, I, you know, I do cocaine, right? Um, and so, you know, metal can have all different uh, aspects. There can be the very aggressive, dark, aggression for its own sake, angry, right? There can be the, hey, we just like to party, man. You know, think about uh, Kiss as a band, right? Rock and roll all night and party every day. That's not so much about aggression, is it? Um, so there, there's a wide spectrum and we can say similar things about other musical genres as well. Now we're getting kind of far afield from Hesiod, but it's an interesting digression nonetheless. Any other questions, comments? Um, while you're writing stuff down, I'll mention that in the sessions to come, we're going to be spending the next two months on Aristotle. We're going to begin with looking at what he has to say about anger in rhetoric book two. That's really the first, let's call it, you know, systematic psychological examination of anger in antiquity. So Aristotle is kind of a groundbreaker. And then we're going to look at what he has to say in other works like the Nicomachean and Eudamian ethics, the politics where it's about, you know, a cause of breakdown in society, um, the topics where he's got a number of like offhand remarks about anger, um, poetics as well, where we're talking about, you know, social, uh, representation and products and, you know, like plays and in our time TV shows and things like that. Uh, and then we're going to uh, look at, as we move into the fall, we're going to look at um, some more poetry. We're going to look at Aeschylus and the Oresteia trilogy. And we're going to look at um, uh Euripides' Medea and Sophocles' Ajax. Anger plays a major role in both of those as well. 
And then we're going to um, look at, if I remember right, what the Epicureans have to say, and we'll get into a little bit of Stoic work by December. So we have a whole lineup, and then we'll start it again the year after that. So we're going to be doing these monthly sessions like this for quite a while. So I don't see any other um, questions or comments. Um, oh, Corrupt U Ukraine. What a weird title there. Uh, I want to love po poetry. How do I do it? I don't know. I mean, read it, read some more, you know, I, I don't, I don't know you. I don't know your background, your makeup, your mental affections or anything like that. And poetry covers a wide range. Um, but the one thing you can say is you're not going to, you know, with, as with anything else, you're not going to really get to know it unless you spend a good bit of time with it. So maybe that's where to start. Um, any other questions, comments? Well, <clears throat> maybe we'll wrap up here then. Thanks for everybody for joining in. And like I said, next time, Aristotle's uh, Rhetoric, book two. A uh, lot of really great stuff on anger in there. Cool stuff in Hesiod. If you haven't read Hesiod, it's a it's a quick read because the works and days, theogony, not very long. You could read through all of these things in just an afternoon. Um, so that could be, you know, quite nice. It's certainly over the weekend, you could read all of Hesiod. So, all right, I will sign off and say I'll see you later on down the line.